but I'm not going to focus on that for a moment. We're going to focus on the differences. There are so many differences represented in this room. I mean, just how can there not be? Genetics, right? Differences in genetics. Our uh, environments, both that we're living in now and that we grew up in. Our history. Our, um, our ethnicities. Uh, in the Bible, whenever you see the word nations, it's ethnos. All the different ethnicities. And yet, can you believe that our differences make us stronger? God created human beings so that that would be the case. If any two of us are absolutely identical, someone has said one of us is super, superfluous. That's a hard thing to say. But we're not necessary if we're actually identical. Now, we have identical twins here today, <laughs> right? Ben and Matthias. And one has glasses on and one doesn't. But that's the only difference. <laughs> So, one of you isn't necessary now. <laughs> Rock, baby. Um, so, so here's the thing. Genetics, very similar. Environment, for 18 years, very similar. History. And yet, Ben and Matthias, are you guys different? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're different. And yet, your differences make you stronger. If we were to gather everyone's feet into a circle, there's probably not any two people in a group this size that even has the same brand of shoes today. I mean, it could be, but probably not. We're probably all wearing different brands of pants, of of shirts, of blouses, of sweaters. Like, I just see all the differences. There's no two alike. Out in the parking lot, there's probably no two cars alike. Isn't that interesting, the way there's just so many brands of everything? Because we want choices. We're different. We're so different. You say, wait a minute. Don't you become like the people you live with? Have you heard that expression? There are some couples here who've been married for... 40, 50, 60, 120 <laughs> years. Like, some of the couples here had Adam and Eve as their babysitters for their kids. Okay, not the biblical Adam and Eve. There's probably another Adam and Eve somewhere, right? But Karen and I, when we were first married, when it was nighttime, when it was bedtime, okay, this is not gonna get awkward for anyone but Karen and I, all right? But when it was bedtime, we would have our, our individual routines, our collective routine, and then we would always kiss each other and say, I love you. And then this magical thing happened. We would turn off the lights. It would be dark. It would be quiet. And we'd fall asleep. Today, things are quite a bit different. Well, there's a few things similar. It's bedtime, and so we have our independent and together routines, and then we kiss each other and say, I love you, and then one of us puts on a noise machine. Now, it's called a white noise machine. I don't know what's white about it. I think I've told you that we've had construction in our neighborhood for the past six months. It got unbearably loud sometimes, but it would start at about 7 a.m., but we never heard it because the noise machine was louder. We have a major train track goes through our neighborhood less than 100 meters from our home. Sometimes huge locomotives, noisy locomotives go by. Not as noisy as the noise machine. The train and the construction can be happening at the same time, not as loud as the noise machine. And then we have a fan above our bed. <laughs> What's it got, 40 or 50 blades in it, I think? And when it's on high speed, you can actually see the roof moving toward the bed. I'm actually afraid that the ceiling is going to collapse one of these days. And then, one of us likes the room really cold. So cold that, I mean, here's the upside. When, when our freezer's a little bit over full, we can hang meat from the curtain rods in our bedroom. <laughs> Literally the other night, I said, well, one of us said to the other, 
between the noise, the fan, and the cold, I feel like I'm falling asleep on the tarmac of an airport runway in the middle of winter. And the other person just laughed at me. As I pulled up my sheet, my 14 blankets, and zipped up my parka. So it's okay, we've worked it out. But the differences, the differences over the years have just, you know, they've been accentuated. So here's the thing. Our differences make us stronger. But it begs the question, how in the world can a group of people in a church with all their differences ever hope to get on the same page about who we are and what we do. With the reality that God brought us together and our differences make us stronger. We're going to talk about it today through something called Belmont Village Church Basics. So essentially, this will become, depending on how this goes, our newcomers class. All right, part one and part two. So this morning is part one. Now, before we get into the material, because of this morning here in church, I felt just really prompted by God's Spirit to, to speak about something that God spoke to me recently through the text that was just read a few minutes ago in Luke 5. And I want to share this with you because it's for each one of us and it's for our church. So when he, who's the he here? Jesus. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon. So here's the context. He's at the uh, Sea of Galilee. There's a huge crowd surrounding him. He would like to speak to them, but the only way is to get some distance from them. So he sees two boats, and the fishermen are over here washing their nets. So it doesn't even say that he asked permission. He just gets onto one of the boats. It happens to be Peter's. So I can see Peter running across saying, hey, what's going on? And then he says, just let out a little bit so I can be a bit of a distance from the shore. Jesus sits down in the boat, and he begins to teach the people. That's where we pick up the story. When he had finished speaking, he then turns to Simon directly. And he said to Simon, you know, I thought about, that's just like Sunday mornings, isn't it? Sunday by Sunday, someone stands up here and speaks to us all. But do you ever get the distinct feeling that God is speaking to you directly? Sometimes. And that's what's happening in this moment. He said to Peter, and I got to tell you, when I read this recently, it was like, he said to me. I put my name in there. Could I invite you today to put your name in there? He said to me. Put your name in there. And here's what he said. Put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Oh, deep waters are scary. We don't want to go out into deep waters, right? But it's in the deep waters that he says we're to go and to let down our nets with this promise for a catch. Now notice, notice Simon, who is Peter. Simon, his response, he answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. That's Simon Peter being polite. Because what he could have said was, uh, okay, uh, itinerant preacher man, Rabbi, you're not a commercial fisherman like we are. We know how fishing works. We fish at night. That's when the fish don't bite. They, they get into the nets, right? And we don't fish in the daytime. And, and did you notice we were cleaning our nets? We don't want to get them dirty again. But he's very polite about it. And he says, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Isn't that curious? Do you know what happened the chapter before? Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. She had been very sick, and he had healed her. Now, some humorously say, that's why Peter denied Jesus three times, because he healed his mother-in-law. That's a terrible joke. Terrible joke, I would never tell it. I'm just repeating what someone else said. But no, he appreciated, 
he appreciated his mother-in-law and he appreciated that Jesus raised her. And I think that's why he is so obliging here. But notice what it says. And these are the six words that jumped out at me. Because you say so, I will. Man, that spoke to me. He said to Gord, and my response is because you say so, I will. In fact, that should be a bumper sticker. It should be a fridge magnet. It should be a tattoo on our foreheads. Because you say so, I will. See, faith, faith is a muscle. Did you know that? It's a muscle. And if we don't use it, it will atrophy. I have it all figured out is not a muscle. But faith is a muscle. And so look at verse 6. When they had done so, when they took the step of faith, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. And I love the way this, this section ends in verse 10 and 11. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid from now on. You will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Even when I don't understand, even when I think I know better, that could have been Peter's attitude. Because you say so, I will. So through this morning and this week, may we hear Jesus himself say to us, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. BBC Basics. This is part one of a part two class, okay? So this first part is very foundational because we need a foundation when we're building something, correct? Belmont Village Church's story. And it's more elaborate than what you're about to see, but God is always writing his story. And so in 2001, Grace Mennonite Brethren Church. In 2012, Radiant City Church. And in the fall of 2022, Belmont Village Church. So in 2001, Grace Mennonite Brethren Church began as a group of 17 people who loved God, cared for each other, and wanted to see the KW community meet and follow Jesus. In 2012, Radiant City Church began as a group of 31 people who loved God and many of whom moved into specific under-resourced KW neighborhoods with prayer, presence, and a desire for people to meet and follow Jesus. Through a series of God-arranged events during the fall of 2022, or 2021, our two churches began to meet together on Sundays and in the fall of 2022, followed God's direction to become one group of people who would be better together, caring for each other, and reaching out to the people of KW. And Belmont Village Church was born. And God is still writing his story. And we don't know what the next chapter is, but that's the exciting part about it. And you're here today because that story may very well include you. Now, can we make an assumption? Every church, every church that's composed of followers of Jesus, composed of disciples of Jesus, on mission with God to see lost people found, every church like that is similar in many ways. Similar in their beliefs, similar in their behaviors. Does that make sense? Having said that, there is a uniqueness about every church. Yes, the difference is the people and the people chemistry. That's true. And the history of the people that have come together. But the big difference, the big difference in combination with the people chemistry that creates a particular and specifically unique church culture is this. The game plan. The game plan. We want what God wants. And that is for all of us to have roots and wings. To have roots, to have a strong relationship, connection with God and with people. 
We want people to have roots of, of experiencing forgiveness, of belonging. And we want people, because God wants people to have wings, to have purpose, to win spiritually, and to win in life. Relationship and responsibility. God wants that for each one of us. Well, sports teams have a game plan. You, in your life, need a game plan. I need a game plan. A church needs one as well. What do we believe? This is what comprises the game plan. What do we believe? What do we see? What do we see God doing? And what do we see God seeing and that he wants us to see? And then what do we do? Well, where do we get this game plan? It has to be from Jesus. It has to be from Jesus. The person of Jesus. The love of of Jesus, the, the teachings of Jesus, the ethics of Jesus, that the early church was known as the way, the way of Jesus. That's what we're to be about. And so he had three greats. You've maybe heard this before. The great commitment. He said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. If we believe in the great commitment, then what does that look like for us? And how do we do it? You've heard of the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. If we believe in the great commandment, what does that look like for us? How do we do it? And then the great commission. <clears throat> Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If we believe the Great Commission, what does that look like for us? How do we do it? Well, it starts with, what do we believe? And so this section is called, Belmont Village Church's Essential Doctrines and Ethics. Now, as we think about these essential doctrines and ethics, I want to borrow a quote that's 400 years old from Meldenius. In essentials, unity. There must be unity. There needs to be unity. In non-essentials, there ne needs to be liberty. In all things, there needs to be charity or love. You say, wait a minute, why spend any time talking about this? Two reasons. <clears throat> because so many church leaders that I speak with talk about how vitally important this is in our churches today. Secondly, because clarity is kindness. Clarity is kindness. Now, even with greater clarity, I can promise that you'll hear something at some point that may lead to a, a misunderstanding and rub you the wrong way. So let's talk about it because that's the way of Jesus. For thousands of years, the global Christian church has shared language for essential doctrines and terms such as God, Jesus, the gospel, heaven, hell, salvation, beliefs. However, a lot has changed in the Western world. The historically agreed upon Christian essentials are not the same anymore. I'm not saying the Christian essentials aren't the same anymore. The agreed upon essentials. With different views by different churches, now we need to have conversations to learn what each person or church considers to be the essentials or non-essentials. Here at Belmont Village Church, as disciples of Jesus, to determine what are the essentials and non-essential beliefs of the Christian faith, we have only two resources. And please hear this, the second needs to be in alignment with the first. The first is this, the whole of God's word. Just two weeks, three weeks ago, we were in Acts 20, where Paul says, I preach to you the whole counsel of God, the whole will of God from the word of God. That is our source for what is essential and non-essential. And secondly, the historical teachings of the church. 
Now, almost immediately people say, wait a minute, I know a lot of historical teachings of the church that were bad. Yes, they didn't align with the first. They must be in agreement with the first. But there are issues, there are doctrines today in the last 30 to 40 years that have come into especially the Western church that had not been in the church until this time. And so the historical teachings of the church as aligned with the whole Bible are important. Listen to the words, I didn't put it on the screen, but listen to the words of Jeremiah 6.16. This is what Yahweh, the Lord, says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. Whoa, the indictment against Israel. Doesn't sound like, because you say so, I will. Does it? They said, we will not walk in it. I, I love what John Mark Comer says. The future of the church is ancient. It's ancient. It's rooted in God's word and the historical teachings of the church that align with his word. So an example, a key example of that is the gospel. The gospel, essential for salvation. There's a number of scriptures that speak to that so clearly, but, but let me just state it here. We believe that we are in need of God's mercy and that Jesus, the perfect God and perfect man, died on the cross for all we have done against God and God's guidance, that is sin. That Jesus rose from the dead and that he can spiritually live within the life of someone who receives him. We believe that the simple gospel message is all someone needs for salvation. We then grow through the knowledge and practice of further teachings and truths of scripture as disciples who partner in mission together. The gospel is essential for salvation. But because clarity is kindness, let's, let's drill down into that. So, some essential core beliefs that God is creator. That God is triune. Father is God. Son is God. Holy Spirit is God. The virgin conception of Jesus. You often hear the virgin birth. The birth wasn't too unique, but the conception certainly was. That Jesus died for our sins. That Jesus physically rose from death that Jesus is the only way to God, um, that Jesus will physically return, that the scriptures are inspired, trustworthy, and foundational for our lives, that the church is the body of Christ on earth, that there is an eternal heaven and future judgment. And, and may I say this, that that judgment is based on a decision that each one of us makes in this life to either accept or reject the work of Christ on my behalf or my own works on my behalf. It's either Christ's work, and we receive that now, or we stand before God in our own unrighteousness, and we're judged according to our works then. That there are unseen an unseen spiritual realm. These are core beliefs of our church. How about essential core ethics? We believe that an ethic of Jesus that is so core is that we love God and love your neighbor as yourself. That every human being is made in God's image no matter their age, ethnicity, sex, sexual orientation, or beliefs. Jesus invites all equally to submit to him. Repent of sin receive forgiveness, and gain the new ultimate identity of loved child of God. You say, Gord, would you be clear about that? Okay. I'm Gord. I'm a man. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. I'm a heterosexual male. Many identifiers many identifiers, right? But now, as a believer in Jesus, 
born by God's spirit, a child of God, all of these secondary identifiers are not erased, but they become subservient to my new primary identity in Christ. And now I live according to the way of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, and the commands of Jesus. If I had said, as one of my identifiers, that I was a same-sex attracted man who is now a child of God, that secondary identifier may continue to persist but it likewise becomes subservient to the new primary identity in Christ. And I live according to the ways, the teachings, and the commands of Jesus. I'm saying all this because clarity is kindness. An essential core ethic is that all human life matters to God from womb to tomb. That we obey the Sermon on the Mount and all of Jesus' teachings. That we live out of the fruit of the Spirit. And I'll tell you, we can only do this with his empowerment. We've all failed in this. Have we perfectly loved, had joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? But that is an essential core ethic. That we honor the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman as described by Jesus who stood in agreement with Genesis. So much there to unpack, but that's, it stated, essential core ethics. But there's another circle, important but not essential. Important things but not essential. Ways of practicing baptism and communion. Now, will we teach a certain way here that we see as important? Y yes, we believe from God's word in baptism by immersion for a believer after they have trusted Christ. But is it essential for salvation to be baptized that way? No. Um, end times viewpoints. Creation viewpoints. Spiritual gifts and how they're expressed today viewpoints. Predestination versus free will, Calvinism versus Arminianism, heaven and hell descriptions and our understandings of those, women in the church viewpoints. Again, these are not salvation issues. Bible translations, interpretations of books. The average Christian has no idea how much debate there are about the book of Jonah and the book of Daniel, and the book of Job, and Revelation, and a few others, Genesis. But those are important, but not essential for salvation. Different forms of local church, whether it's house church, or missional church, or attractional church, or mega church. These are not salvation issues. Will you hear teaching on these subjects as we go through the whole counsel of God? Yes, but we will always try to remember to say that these are not salvation issues. All right, not doctrinally critical. You ready? Musical worship styles. Now, we think lyrics matter. The content of the lyrics, the theology matters. But the actual style, again, it can't, comes down to what's the game plan? Who are we reaching? What are we seeing? And so on. Uh, dress code. Formal versus informal, not doctrinally critical. Obscure, non-doctrinal Bible passages, specifically opinions about these. Just give you a couple of examples so you know what I'm talking about. In Genesis 6, are the Nephilim, the Nephilim, are they fallen angels or are they descendants of Cain? In 1 Samuel 28, did the actual spirit of Samuel speak with the medium? Or was it an impersonating spirit? And does the passage justify having a seance? We actually think that's a pretty important topic, but not doctrinally critical to debate that. Mark 16, should we test the whole picking up snakes with our hands and drinking deadly poison thing to see if it will or won't harm us today? 
That could be critical if you try it. <laughs> but it's not a salvation issue and not doctrinally critical. The order or schedule of a church gathering. Again, the game plan, but not doctrinally critical. How about speculative? Everyone's <laughs> favorite, sadly. Did Adam have a belly button? I mean, he's the only one who was created, did not come from mom, did he have a belly button? Actual date of Christmas. In Jay's most recent book, he has a full chapter on the date of Christmas. He and I have had some fun debates. Do pets go to heaven? Would God need to redeem extraterrestrials if you think they exist? Now, I know some of you are saying, this slide and the previous one, can we have a series on each of these for a, for a week or two? I know that's what we want. Probably not going to happen. <laughs> but here's the thing. There is a fundamentalism view, okay? So here's what a fundamentalist would say about all of this. Everyone needs to have the same beliefs and often methods of, of church, of doing church, Otherwise, they're seen as woke and not taking the scripture seriously. So here's kind of what it looks like for someone who's a fundamentalist. Everything is essential core belief. Everything they teach would be an essential core belief. Well, that took a while. Here's what a hyper-progressive liberalist would say that core essential beliefs of historic Christianity are not essential. Since the Bible isn't seen as truly inspired, some doctrines and ethics can become subjective. Usually more than one path leads to God. All people are saved, and the atonement of Jesus isn't necessary. And so, this is what their board would look like, so to speak. It's kind of a smorgasbord, it's a cafeteria. You choose you. You choose what you want to believe, and we can all find unity around that. But then, there's the historical view. Here is what a historical Christian faith would say. The, there are very important core and essential beliefs and ethics that the church has believed throughout history. The focus is on these beliefs with an openness to differences of opinion on secondary issues. Now again, why have I talked about this for so long? Because I talk to a lot of pastors and church leaders, and what I'm sharing here needs to be said today. In a newcomer's class, in a basics of the church course like this, because clarity is kindness. So, Belmont Village Church in the culture. How do we give expression? We talked about the great commitment and great commandment and great commission, but what does that look like for BBC in the context of, of this North American culture, this, this Southern Ontario, Kitchener-Waterloo culture? Well, here are our options. Cultural condemnation or cultural accommodation. Now, there is a third option, okay? But just a bit of a history lesson. In the 1950s, the people who were condemning the culture were known as the fundamentalists. And the people who were accommodating were called modernists. More recently, and until this day, the cultural con condemners seem to be known as evangelicals, right? And, and the progressives would be accommodating. But here's a third way, and that's cultural transformation. And so, who was leading that in the 50s? It was the evangelicals. It was those who just believed that the gospel needed to penetrate every single heart. And today, that identity is to be determined. It really is. How will the church, especially in the West, be known? But we want to be and do what God wants us to be and do here at this church. May Belmont Village Church look so much like Jesus that the culture will be transformed through us. Amen. How does God use people to transform a culture? Well, very simply, people living and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So very quickly, as we come to a close, 
BBC's mission, vision, and value statements. And some of you have seen these before, but our mission statement is this. We exist to glorify God by making, maturing, and multiplying disciples of Jesus in community here in KW and to the world. Now that's a little specific, but it's pretty generic. Most churches would have a mission statement like that. But here's our vision statement. In the next five years, we would love to see us to become a praying church of cross-cultural and multi-generational followers of Jesus, neighboring and on mission, both individually and together in community. And these are some of our, our, our values. Incarnating Jesus in ways and words. Disciple-making, maturing and multiplying. Neighboring, being neighbors who are thinking intentionally about the gospel and caring in community, both in our close community and out into the neighborhood. So finally, let's talk then about discipleship and mission here at BBC. And in the class, that's where we would leave it until next time. And in fact, discipleship, we will talk about next Sunday. What are we doing to grow people in, in Bible literacy and gospel identity and gospel fluency? So stay tuned, that and more next time. But in the remaining time, let's talk about mission. We need to go back to these vital need-to-know questions. Who are we and what do we do? Well, we take our cue from who is God and what has he done? Well, who is God? He's a father, right? That's how he reveals himself, as father. What has he done? He's created us in his image. And he adopts us, those who believe in him, as Lord and Savior, taking Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He adopts us as his children. So who are we? We're family. We're the sons and daughters of God. We're brothers and sisters. We are family. Because that's who God is. And because of what he has done, he's made us family. So what do we do? We love and share our lives with one another as brothers and sisters. But that's not the end of the revelation of God. He's also the son. And what did he do? He came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And so who are we? We are servants. That same Jesus who did not come to be served but to serve lives in us. And so we're servants, and what do we do? We give ourselves to meet the needs of our church family and the community around us. But God revealed himself as Holy Spirit. And so what has he done? Well, he empowers us to be witnesses of Jesus. What does that make us? It makes us missionaries. And what do we do? We share the gospel with people who don't yet know Jesus. So who are we? We are a family of servant missionaries. We are servants who are missionary families. We are missionaries who are a family of servants. It doesn't matter how you say it. It doesn't matter what direction you, you, you put it. That's who we are. And that's what we do. And so that brings us to missional families. Why missional families? Well, here's the statement. Missional families exist for us to live out our identity as a family of missionary servants in a smaller group of people, i.e. smaller than the entire Sunday morning gathering, organized around a shared mission. That's a key. Organized around a shared mission. And so we're going to talk about very briefly, seven shared missions, and then we're going to sing one more song, pray, and feel free to talk to those missional family leaders out in the foyer with any questions that you have, okay? So, one of the missional families will be Faithful Fitness. Oh, I see the surprise on some faces, that's great. So, Karen and Sarah are going to lead that. You know why? Because they're family. <laughs> they're family. They're sisters. And the time will be Tuesday afternoons weekly in the basement here, which for these purposes 
It's been called many things, the common room, the fellowship hall, but for this purpose, it's going to be the community room. And that's where that's going to happen. And the mission is to love and serve age 50 plus tops women. You say, what are tops women? Go out in the foyer and ask Karen. And friends of BBC women. All women are welcome. All women are welcome no matter what age, but Karen will explain that. I think Sarah's online, so you can maybe ask her online. Another group, another missional family, care and community. Jim and Doris Kober. And I believe someone is represent, yet yeah, Ruth is going to represent them this, this week. Wednesday afternoons, bi-weekly. The location's going to vary because they're meeting with Kurt and Anne and a few other refugee slash community volunteering related ideas. So again, see Ruth about that. Another missional family, learning English conversation circles. And that's uh, Karen and I. And Thursday evenings, bi-weekly. It'll be right here at the church building. And we'll be using the Bible to teach English and conversation to build relationships. The Bible to teach English and conversation to build relationships. And then Belmont Village Church Youth, BBC Youth, Brooke and Helen, Kevin and Farah. Friday, yeah, that got a whoo, that's great. Fridays, 7 to 9 p.m., I think it'll probably be later, it always is, bi-weekly at Brooke and Helen's house. Calling all youth, 13 to 18 years old, don't you wish you were in that age range. Join us for some faith, fun, and friendship, and you can be a part of that missional family. Another missional family, Home Fellowship, Ray and Chris Surratt. Saturday afternoons, bi-weekly, at their apartment, right across the street here from BBC, singing, scripture conversations, and fellowship for neighbors and friends. Both inviting them in and going out to them. So home fellowship. Here's another one. Eritrean to Grand Visits with John Teklu, Papa John. So the time is going to be flexible depending on the group schedule. It's going to be one evening per month. The location will vary, but it's visiting Eritrean to Grayan neighbors and newcomers. And the seventh missional family, two by two prayer outreach. Where'd the woo? There's no woo. Yeah, there's the woo. Okay. Second Thursday each month with Aizu and, and Ru. And the location, wherever God's Spirit takes them uptown Waterloo, downtown Kitchener, Vic Park, Victoria. Uh, Waterloo Park, and so on. And the mission is learning to be sensitive and obedient to the Holy Spirit and sharing Jesus with people. That's exciting. That's exciting. Belmont Village Church missional families. May we hear, may you hear the voice of Jesus saying to you, put out into the deep. It's a scary place. And let down your nets. And may you and I simply respond with this, because you say so, I will. Would you pray about it this week? You don't need to sign up today, you can, but all this week um, will be an opportunity to sign up and the groups will begin the beginning week of October. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for <coughs> your word and all that it teaches us. Thank you for Jesus and the great uh, disciple maker that he not only was, that he is. And, and the, the same one who made disciples who made disciples is still making disciples who make disciples. God, we take our lead from you. We just want to be a family of servant missionaries. Call us to it. May we hear your voice. God, thank you for uh, this group of people that you've called together for such a time as this to serve this generation. Our story is so incredibly short and brief. But God, your story goes on and on, and we're just a small sliver of it. So thank you for the privilege of being a part of your grand narrative. We love you because you first loved us. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.